Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank all of our witnesses who are here uh, today. Uh, as many of you know, um, I'm a physician and a former director of the Department of Public Health, uh, and so I take public health very seriously, and I recognize the important role, and for me, uh, the CDC prior to the pandemic was the premier institution, but I also recognize the important role of state health departments and local public health agencies in keeping Americans safe. In April of this year, I released a CDC RFI request for information to hundreds of stakeholders requesting feedback on how to sensibly and effectively reform America's top communicable diseases agency. And I want to address and clarify some comments made by um, Representative Dr. Ruiz. First, this was an RFI that my office sent publicly to stakeholders and constituents to seek feedback and input on CDC reform as a result of the CDC's many failures. This was not a letter sent to the CDC, though I would also welcome their feedback and input. And in fact, to this end, I met privately with Dr. Walensky and a staff member. It sounds like there are many opportunities for improvement based upon the discussion today, and I thank you for that. And I welcome additional conversations with Dr. Ruiz and his staff as a constructive and thoughtful ways to reform the CDC. Not surprisingly, public trust in the CDC is at an all-time low, and health experts across the nation have presented many suggestions on how to rebuild that trust. During the pandemic, much of the CDC's guidance did not appear to emanate from data and scientific evidence, and they certainly weren't able to incorporate real-world evidence that was occurring and data and research occurring in other countries. Um, rather, the data seemed to come from political interests, such as the clear coordination between the CDC and the American Federation of Teachers Unions on school closures, despite clear evidence that children did not transmit the virus and they were not super spreader organizations. And we, in fact, opened our schools in Iowa in April of 2020. To the CDC's credit, however, they recognized the declining public trust, which led Dr. Walensky to launching the Moving Forward Initiative. This effort included reorganization and potential requests for new authorities from Congress. As part of the initiative, CDC acknowledges that the agency faces significant structural and systematic operational challenges. One of those was just discussed, and that's data. Uh, and it indicates a central goal to create new internal processes, systems, and governance to empower leaders, align incentives, and hold CDC accountable. Dr. Hogue, in your written testimony, you highlight the confusing and backward school closure guidance, stating that the recommendation to keep schools shut down was unthinkable. And I asked Dr. Walensky in testimony if she had contacted the state of Iowa or the state of Iowa's Department of Education for their experiencing, experiences with opening schools. Can you detail what you believe the science behind Dr. Walensky's school closure recommendations, why it was so flawed, and what guidance reforms the Moving Forward Initiative should include? Um, yes. So, um, so we had data at the time um, of the that the winter of 2021, the February of 2021 guidance um, from essentially all over the world of schools reopening um, safely, successfully, um, and I think most of the world recognize that schools should be open by default and that closing schools is an emergency measure. And so, also in our own country, we had private schools, public schools in many states, often depending on political affiliation, that were already open, had data. It wasn't just my Wisconsin study. It was the diocese, very diverse diocese that I'm um, a medical advisor for that we had uh, successfully reopened with very so simple, um, straightforward mitigation strategies that um, there, there was a total lack of sort of commitment and creativity and willingness to get these kids back into school and then, you know, figure out, how, you know, how to make it as safe as possible. And so I, I, I do think it's, it's, it is unthinkable what happened the way the data were ignored from really all over the world in our own country about how schools could be reopened safely, considering the enormous damage from prolonged school closures that we all knew was coming and we see the effects of now. As a first-term congresswoman, my first uh, markup hearing on education and uh, labor committee brought up uh, school closures, uh, the rate of uh, youth suicide, uh, the rate of mental health, uh, and um, 
uh, depression and anxiety and what that has done. So not only the learning loss, but the obesity, the uh, physical uh, effects, and also the tremendous mental effects that closing schools had on our children and a uh, generation that may be lost um, uh, and difficult to recover. So thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you for, despite all of the pushback, I've been part of that, that you were willing to continue to publish and to make known your findings. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Generally, lady yields back. I now recognize Ms. Castor.